Hey everybody, welcome back to the Syracuse Builders Exchange. I'm Ed, Ed Sheets, and we're here today to have a class with regard to contract documents. What we're gonna do is focus on certain new or some changes to the AIA documents. They're not new anymore. This, the newest AIA was, uh, these changes were about four years ago, but they uh, continue. And also by discussing these items, we'll be able to also discuss things that you find in other places. So while it's focused on AIA documents, these clauses are everywhere. And what we're going to talk about uh, is everywhere as well. Toward the end, if time permits us, I'm going to add on to the discussion about AIA documents and talk a little bit about the Uniform Commercial Code. Article two of the Uniform Commercial Code is the law, if you will, of contract between suppliers and purchasers of goods. And we'll take a peek at Article two of the UCC, a few important issues, just to let you know it's out there. Um, again, I'm Ed. Ed Sheets with Sheets and Bailey. Across the room from me here is our IT guru, Tom Chick with Real World IT Solutions. Tom will be uh, helping me when I fumble trying to do IT things this afternoon, which I will inevitably do. I wanna thank Earl Hall and the board from the Syracuse Builders Exchange. This is, I believe my 30th year doing training for SBE. And I always have a lot of fun with it. I usually have a lot more fun because you're usually here, but you're not. Uh, sometime in the near future, I understand that all of these classes that I've done this spring, and I think this is the fourth or fifth one, will be available, uh, I believe on the SBE website or on a link on the website. So that will be helpful as well if you know of others, or if you want to look back at something that we talk about, you'll be able to do that. I, at your leisure, at your convenience. I just today did a lunch and learn for a client where we talked about a few of the issues we're going to talk about here. And I'll be switching over in a minute or two to PowerPoint uh, so you can follow that. But uh, I told that client a, a story with regard to a case that I was involved in. So if they're here on the, uh, on the webinar now, you can uh, go pour a cup of coffee. But I'll tell you the story as well, because the story, a real story, gives a bit of a context to what we're doing. I had a client a number of years ago that had a project to remediate contaminated soils for a county sheriff's department. It was in Broome County. And while they were remediating the contaminated soils, you know, they were contaminated with lead. Okay, this was a gun range. It had been a gun range for 40, 50 years. They were gonna build a new gun range. So you gotta get the soil out of there cause it's full of lead. So while they're remediating the soil, they're remediating, they're removing the soil, they come across contaminated organics, stumps, wood, other organic, you know, decomposed things, partially decomposed things that are there in this large mass of soil, which was the, the, the backdrop, I guess you would say for the gun range. And they uh, contacted the rep from Broome County who was there on site and said, hey, look, we've got these, these organics. Uh, that's not in our scope. And the person from Broome County said, yeah, you're right. Why don't you send me something? So they sent uh, uh, to the person from Broome County a, a, a fax, if you remember faxes back in the day, which said removal of organics at whatever it was, dollars per ton and signed it and faxed it off to the county's rep who was on site, who very promptly in the top left corner wrote, agreed, okay, signed his name and wrote in quantities to be negotiated and faxed it back to my guy. So then my guy went out and remediated the contaminated organic, removed and remediated contaminated organics as well. Sent a bill for around $110,000. And the bill sat there and sat there, you know, they had more work to do, project closeout was a you know, month or so away. Uh, so when it came time to uh, close out the job, my client said, what, do, you know, what, about my, what about my contaminated soils or contaminated organics? <clears throat> and the guy from the county said, well, I gotta you know, see what my boss says about that. 
And lo and behold, Broome County says, well, we're not gonna pay you for it. So too bad you don't get your $110,000. Thank you for the free work, now go away. And it was after that point in time that my phone rang. And the reason that Broome County wouldn't pay him, uh, there were two. They didn't dispute the work he did. They didn't dispute that it was extra work. They didn't even dispute the quantities invoiced. Broome County said, you didn't follow the notice of claim clause in your contract. And you know, the guy who wrote on the letter agreed okay and signed his name, he didn't have authority to do that. So we're not gonna pay you. And we took our best shot in court, but we lost. And the court agreed with Broome County. And the court said, you know, you've got these clauses in these contracts. And Mr. Sheets, one judge said to me, your contractor isn't, can't complain that he didn't read the contract because contract is, as the judge said, the root word of contractor. So that contractor lost 110 grand for not knowing what hopefully, you know, in 50 minutes or so when we're done, you'll have some understanding about. Um, that's what this is all about. <clears throat> we're going to talk about some, as I said, selected clauses from the AIA document, but these things are everywhere. They're not just in the AIA document, okay? We're gonna talk about the AIA 8201 general conditions for the general contract for construction. We're also gonna talk about the AIA A401 standard form subcontract, okay? So I'm going to turn over to uh, hopefully PowerPoint if I do this capably. I'm good? Okay, I'm good. If you have questions, uh, if you were here with me, you would ask me and I would tell you, I would answer. Uh, I understand there's a, the chat here. You can chat your questions into us. Tom will alert me when that happens. Okay, or you can unmute your speaker, or your uh, microphone as well, and just say something. So we have that, uh, that at your discretion when a question comes up, just please ask away. Um, anyway, any questions before I get going? And once, and twice, boom. The first thing that I've got, oh, by the way, you should also have a handout. I believe Melissa from the Builders Exchange uh, emailed to each of you, or it's accessible one way or another, about a 40. Tom says there's a link in the chat window for the handout. The course materials, it's 40 some pages. Uh, so you're welcome to follow along. I'll let you know where I'm at, but I have on the screen on the PowerPoint, the summary items that I'll be discussing in any event. If for some reason there's a problem, you can't find the link or whatever, just send us a chat. Tom will find it and he'll fix it because he finds and fixes everything because he's like that. <laughs> so the first thing I wanna talk about, which uh, helps a contractor or a subcontractor understand the issue with regard to these, you know, how could that case happen? How could Broome County get away with, with doing that to a contractor? Um, is the issue with regard to notice of claim. Now, if uh, some of you have been in earlier classes, we've done this here, some of this will be familiar to you because we talked about it with regard to state agency contracts and so forth, um, but not in as much detail with regard to the AIA documents. And by the way, if you were with us in an earlier class too, we will be covering a number of topics here that we didn't do there, although there may be, there will be a little bit of overlap on some of the issues. So that being said, uh, go back to my, my Broome County case, okay? And we see that the 2017 AIA document, the A201, tells us that notice when you want to give notice, there's two different kinds of notice. One on the screen is notice under section 1.6.1. And the other is notice of claim under 1.6.2. And they're two different things. So the contract being the rules of the, or the law between the parties to the contract with the AIA system, you've got notice and then you've got notice of claim. 
So what's the difference? Well, notice of claim is certainly, well, it is what it is. If you have a claim, and we'll talk about how they're defined under the document, that's important. Then you have to follow it as a notice of claim. What's important here is, remember the, what Broome County did to my contractor. The guy who was in the trailer on site signed off on this. Uh, in writing, on a letter with a price agreed to, okay? But Broome County got away with not paying the contractor for the simple, one of the simple reasons was my contractor didn't send this notice or this letter to the right person. Wrong person, you don't get paid. So a contract will typically designate who is to receive notices from both the parties to the contract. There will be a name. There is nothing wrong with putting two names in there um, because project managers kind of sometimes tend to come and go. You might want to put in a, your PM in his or her email address, but also uh, someone from the home office an officer of the company who might be involved in the project because it's better two people getting notice, especially if notice is sent to somebody who is gone from the company because you know they tend to go. Now, if you've got a claim, and in a few minutes, we'll talk about what a claim includes. As I mentioned at that lunch and learn session I did today, uh, the word claim, be it under AIA or under other contract documents, means a lot more a lot more, a lot more than what people typically think. We'll see that in a little while. But if you have a claim for adjustments in contract money, adjustments in contract time, uh, this is how it's got to go. It's got to go to the designated representative. It's got to go by certified registered mail or courier providing proof of delivery. This is what the contract says. <clears throat> The contract doesn't say email, does it? It says certified or registered or by courier. So send off your Pony Express person to, uh, to deliver your notice of claim. Remember, as I always point out, contracts are often changed. The standard forms are often changed by supplementary general conditions. So uh, always check those things. Your supplementary general conditions might be <clears throat> attached right behind the AIA standard form, be it a subcontract or a contract. Or they can also be in the front end of the spec book, like division zero, division one stuff. So please look for that to see if they've added email or some other method of how to give that notice of claim. Under the AIA document, it has to be in writing to the designated representative. Um, and we'll go to notice of claim. We did that already. Okay, so that was the first couple pages of the handout. Any questions about that? The notice issue, this is simply where the notice goes, not when it's given not what it looks like, not what goes into it. That's gonna happen a little bit later. So that's how the notice has to be given to whom that is. Uh, but let's look at owner finances. <clears throat> I'm gonna take these in the order they're in in the AIA documents. And now obviously you're interested in the owner finances primarily if you're a GC or a prime to the owner. Uh, subcontractor might be interested in as well and might want to get some of this or might wanna ask their upline to get some of this information. The AIA document of paragraph 2.2 permits the contractor to get information with regard to the owner of finances, either prior to commencement or after commencement, okay? Prior to commencement, you do it by written request, okay? And if you don't get it, you have no obligation to begin the work. The problem is that the document doesn't really tell us what's adequate or what you can get. There's no laundry list in the AIA document, okay? Um, our suggestion has been since this document came out <clears throat> a few years ago, modify it to list the things that you as a contractor might want to get from an owner, you know, evidence of funding, copy of a loan contract, 
things of this nature. Who's the bank? How much is the loan? Um, but if you don't get it, no obligation to commence. Now, what about after commencement of the work? What happens after you start on the job? Your ability to get owner financial information is constrained a little bit if you're looking for it after commencement of work. If the owner fails to make a payment and in writing the contractor identifies a concern about the owner's financial ability, in other words, not just I want it because it'll upset you, I want it because here is my concern, I think maybe there's a financial issue. And if there's a material change to the contract, which means a more than just a small extra, if they don't give it, <clears throat> You have to give them 14 days, you can stop work, but that is a very, very, very risky thing to do. Call somebody in our line of work, call an experienced lawyer before you decide to stop work on a project, okay? Uh, moving on. Talking about the AIA documents still. Any questions about, from anybody about the owner, the owner of financial stuff? Uh, differing site conditions is discussed on page seven of that handout that you'll have. And uh, differing site conditions uh, is worth a moment of focus because the notice mechanism, if you're dealing with a differing site condition, a DSC, is a little bit different than the typical notice of claim that we're going to see in a few more pages. Okay. People, when they hear of differing site conditions, typically think about something that might be subsurface, rock, an oil tank, <clears throat> water, something subsurface that is going to impact the constructability and or function of the foundation system, things of this nature. It's gonna make it hard to do the work. Obviously, differing site conditions are not just below ground. They're below ground, they're above ground. Uh, you could have a differing site condition in an existing facility that you're remodeling. Okay? If you encounter asbestos, it might be a differing site condition if it is not something that was anticipated in the project documents. Um, if your project documents were silent about the presence of this thing, then you want to give notice. If your contract documents said it was going to be a certain quantity or a certain location, and what you're encountering is more and or elsewhere, then you've encountered a differing site condition and you want to give notice, okay? The last bullet here says 14 days notice from first observance. The way that a differing site condition claim has to be mechanized is you gotta give notice and you should give it really before you proceed, always. Um, differing site condition, <coughs> Its issues are too important. They can lead to too many problems if you just keep working and don't stop and tell somebody about it. Okay. So stop 14 day notice, get your notice out there of the different site condition. The 14 day notice is going to be different a little bit than the notice of claim that you're going to see in a little while. I went backwards, hang on a second. This is why I have Tom here, so when I mess up the PowerPoint. So now under the new AIA document, uh, minor changes to the work, there is a new catch in here uh, that really is kind of important because it's a gotcha clause. Uh, why is this important to subs? Because I know some of you on here are subs. Uh, it's important because this type of a clause could be in your subcontract as well. And or this type of clause could be incorporated into your subcontract by what we call a flow down clause, a flow down provision. Um, but minor changes are defined as change that does not involve an adjustment in contract sum or contract time, <clears throat> it's a minor change. Uh, if it does under the AIA document, if it does affect the sum or the time, 
contractor shall, shall notify the architect and shall not proceed, shall not proceed. That means don't do it. That means don't go any further. Because if you do proceed, according to the clause, you will have waived your right to any adjustment for that work. So if you encounter the situation, <clears throat> if you intend to get money, stop. Because if you don't stop, you're going to waive your right to get money. That's a bad thing. That means you don't get paid. Nobody likes that. Uh, that's discussed on page nine. The um, horseback riding through the AIAs, the, uh, the payment terms have changed a bit and there's something very important here as well, a very important change. Uh, we talked earlier about getting to a point where I'll tell you what a claim is or we'll look at the contract document because it defines that. <clears throat> All contracts typically define what a claim is. But within the payment clause, within the new payment clause, some of it is familiar stuff. You know, along with your application, you've got to have substanti data substantiating the right to payment. Those things are typically defined. They're going to include subcontractor release and waiver documents. They're going to include your own release and waiver documents. It might be certified payrolls. Um, <clears throat> it could be record documentation. It could be anything. It'll be spelled out often in a spec. Okay. Uh, but the, the second bullet point here for waivers and releases, which accompany a progress payment billing. Let me please red flag the issue because this is extremely important. Very, very often we see the release and waiver documents that have to accompany a progress payment application contain language that can be very, very detrimental to the sub or the contractor that is signing the document. It's a big problem. <clears throat> very often, we will see language with a progress payment release and waiver document that says that previous and open claims are included in this application for payment. That means you're waiving them unless they're in this number. Look for waiver and release language. Every time you, you sign a progress payment release document, Sometimes they end up releasing much more than what you think. Um, what I typically do is I give what I believe to be conservative advice to my subs and to my GCs when it comes to this. And that is, if you have open and outstanding extras, if there is an open issue with a delay or something of that nature, Indicate that on the release document, attach it if you can, uh, give us a call, but do something to flag open and unresolved extras, any delays that are out there, because very often we'll find language in these documents that say that's it. Watch as well, just as a quick aside, for similar language when you sign a change order. Very often a change order will say that this includes all impacts and delays related to the change. So you sign a bunch of those as you're going through a project. Don't expect to make a delay claim later because you will have indicated by signing a change order that you've just gotten paid for that because you included it in your change order. Watch this stuff. Somebody's always out there waiting to keep your money. Okay. All you got to do is give them a chance. Now, under the 2017 AIA document, the last uh, two bullet points are important. If the contractor disputes the architect's decision on an application for payment, under the contract, <clears throat> the contractor must submit a claim. That wasn't there before. That's new to 2017. That's important. And if the payment mechanism in the AIA 201 is incorporated into your subcontract, then this could apply to you, subcontractor, supplier, as well. So 
if the application for payment is for $50,000 and the upline, the owner of the GC says, no, 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 you've only got about $25,000 done. You know, you think you're at X percentage and they want to say you're at X minus 15%. You now have a dispute with regard to a pay application. When that arises, after 2017 in the AIA documents, you have to submit a claim. Remember the first couple slides, the earlier discussion, your claim has got to go to the right person because if it doesn't, you're out of luck, okay? So what are claims? Claims under the contract include many things beyond what people typically are accustomed to calling claims. I have found a lot of people who have a perception that a claim is a, a bad thing, a claim is a delay claim, something of that nature, and you shouldn't make claims. You know, we're not a claiming contract or something like this. But a claim, and this is not new to AIA, by the way, is defined to include many things like the payment of money, like a change in contract time, okay? And then you look at these other three and it sounds like just about everything. And then the last bullet point was if you had liquidated damages, the owner doesn't have to give a claim to the contractor for assessing LDs, which seems unfair. But if you sign the document, you agree to this. There it is. Now, you know, money is clear. We want money. Okay, we encountered a condition. We, we asked for extra work. The specs <clears throat> called for 2,000 blue widgets. We we're installing 2,200 blue widgets, whatever it might be. But let's pause for a second and talk about contract time because an extension of contract time <clears throat> can be very important and also must be processed under the changes clause. It's a claim, okay? One of the reasons it can be important is if you're in a context with liquidated damages, you're a sub, if you're a GC. Um, <clears throat> the example I give, and the example I gave at lunch today was you finish the job and you get a letter from <clears throat> the GC, you get a letter from the owner that says, well, you know, you are uh, 60 days late and that's $2,000 a day. So that's $120,000. So we're taking that off of your retainage, <clears throat> keeping it, goodbye. We're keeping our liquidated damages, okay? This is not unusual, this happens, all right? Then you say, well, wait a minute. That guy over there, Tom Chick, he delayed the job. He cost me a week because he didn't have the rebar in. And this other guy, and then you weren't ready, and then you changed the third floor. And when you change the third floor, we had to reroute the whatever, bada boom, bada boom. <clears throat> so yeah, it took 60 more days to finish the job, but it's not my fault, okay? So if I'm the owner and you make that and you say that to me, I'm gonna say, well, where's your notice of claim for an extension of time? And you're gonna say, no, I don't know. It could, failing to ask for an extension of time, in the face of LDs could impact your ability to defend against a claim of liquidated damages. I'm not saying it would destroy your ability to defend, but if you're faced with LDs, the better position, the better practice in my opinion, would be to have asked for an extension of time as required by the contract uh, rather than not, okay? So my point is whether it's AIA, uh, whether it's any contract, for the most part, <clears throat> claim is defined broadly to mean more than just bad things. It's defined broadly to mean extra work, extra time, and it can mean a number of other things. So 
That's what a claim is. So, let's go back. Under AIA, let's see, I'm just moving through my handout here. Page, I'm on page 13 if you're flipping it through that handout. Under the base AIA document, the base unedited or unrevised contract document, you must give notice of claim, a uh, claim by the owner against the contractor or the contractor or against the owner within 21 days after the occurrence of the thing uh, that causes you problems. So if it's a, and this is different than differing site condition, right? It's a different amount of time. Uh, but if you're in an extra work, <clears throat> plans and specs type of change, 21 days from when you first recognize the issue. If you're being delayed, <clears throat> 21 days from when you first recognize the issue. If you're late, you're late. And it can and very often does give a court a basis to deny the claim and say you don't get paid, okay? 21 days after the occurrence <clears throat> or 21 days after you first recognize the condition, don't play around. If you hear about it, write about it. Or if you hear about it, at least know you've got to write about it. Your field, your home office have got to connect on this stuff because <clears throat> a month goes by and you're out of luck. The other reason Broome County didn't pay that contract or what he was owed, undisputedly, but got away with not paying it, was because he waited a period of months before he gave his <clears throat> notice of how much he wanted for this. So not only did that contractor not send it to the right person, but they were late on notice of claim. The appellate court affirmed it. <clears throat> the law in New York State is becoming more and more clear, really, really, with each passing year that these notice of claim provisions, fair or not, can defeat a claim. Uh, we were involved in a project against DASNY for an electrical contract. Like so often happens when you're on the MEP side, that ceiling space might show this much on the, on the spec or on the plans for working space. But then when you get there, it's like that. <clears throat> and the plumber and the mechanical have gone ahead of you and you're the electrical guy. So the electrical guy incurred additional labor costs installing cable tray and installing cable in the tray. Okay. Common sense. Harder to work in a small congested spot than it is in a larger, less congested spot, MEP. Okay. Contractor wanted a couple hundred grand. The state agency DASNY said, we'll give you like 70,000. My contractor said no. And they moved forward, did other work. <clears throat> state tried to issue a forced change order, contractor rejected it. Now the job is substantially complete, okay? Now the contractor brings up, and this is many months later, obviously, if you're talking about it, that, that dimension, in the ceiling space, that's gonna be one of the first things you as an electrical contractor encounter. So a year later, uh, job is substantially complete, contractor brings it up again. State says, well, we'll still give you what, the forced, what we had in the forced change order. We'll give you 70 for your 200. Contractor says, no, <clears throat> lawsuit ensues, okay? In depositions, two representatives of the state agency testified under oath that the contractor was due money for the condition because it did, A, it was unanticipated, B, it did require additional time and labor to install the cable tray and then the cable in the tray. Um, they didn't dispute that. They agreed in oath in depositions, but the court denied the full $200,000. The reason the court denied the $200,000 is the court said it doesn't matter if the state people agreed that the money was owed, okay? It doesn't matter that they knew about it. 
What matters is that this contractor didn't tell them about it in time under the notice of claim clause with the DASNY contract. So just like Broome County got to walk away from $100,000, Dazzy got to walk away from either 70 or 200, depending upon whose number you wanted, just because a contractor didn't strictly comply with a notice clause. If all of this seems unfair to you, I agree, because it is. But it is what it is. It's the way the courts are dealing with these things. So you got to be careful. 21 days means 21 days. 21 days is often changed in the supplementary conditions. Look for it, please, because it is <clears throat> very often shortened. 14 days, 12 days, seven days, who knows, two days, it could be anything. But you'll be held to whatever is in the supplementary general condition because that will typically take precedence over <clears throat> the standard form document. Read the contract. Um, AIA claims for additional costs. And I'm still on pages 13 and 14 from that handout. <clears throat> uh, notice before contract time, uh, provide an estimate of the cost, probable effect, if it's time, weather. Uh, with the 1997 A201 document, AIA really picked up on supporting claims for weather cause delays. <clears throat> you know, newspaper, uh, US Geological Service stuff, data to substantiate that the weather conditions were not just bad, but unforeseeably bad, okay? You know it's gonna be cold in the winter, you know it's gonna snow in the winter, okay? And that it had an adverse effect on your work. Now, so, okay. <clears throat> You've got your claim, you know who you're gonna send it to, the right person. And you know you've got yourself covered with the 21 days or whatever is in the subcontract or the contract. Now, <clears throat> contracts also have a mechanism that identifies how the claim has to be processed. <clears throat> okay, so you know who it goes to. You know when it, gets, when it has to get there. But do you know how? And if you look at AIA in Article 15, <clears throat> there is a mechanism that has existed for a long time where the architect serves as the initial decision maker. Okay? This can be important both to a contractor and to a sub. First, the claim must be presented to the initial decision maker. Under the contract, that person, the IDM, is typically going to be the architect, okay? <clears throat> and you must ask for an initial decision. If you don't do that, you haven't followed this step in the contract. If you don't follow this step in the contract, then you can run into courts that do the same thing as they do with a late notice of claim. And there are many recent court decisions by the appellate courts <clears throat> that say if the contractor doesn't ask for the initial decision and ask for it from the IDM, the initial decision maker, then they have <clears throat> basically given up their ability to recover from the claim. Um, in my luncheon chat today at the client's offices, I talked about a case in Scarsdale where one of my GCs had something in the area of $4 million that they hadn't gotten paid on a high-end assisted living facility project. So we had to sue. <clears throat> and uh, let's say 2.8 or so was extras, 1.2 was other base contract and retainage maybe, or it could have been the other way around. It doesn't matter. Uh, the One of the defenses raised by the developer on that job was that the GC had not asked for an initial decision. And truth be told, they hadn't. <clears throat> it was a long time after all that happened that we got involved, right? Because nobody calls the lawyer until it's way too late. And the owner developer made a motion to dismiss that part, part of the claims, let's call it 2.8, because of this. <clears throat> and it was a problem. We managed to beat it, 
case ultimately settled a good seven figure settlement. And the only reason we could beat it was because we learned in discovery that the owner and the architect were at odds. The architect stopped working, owner wasn't paying them and the architect wasn't acting on any claims. So we made the argument to the court in Westchester County that it would have been a futile act and that it was waived and we got by, okay? But the fact is <clears throat> you gotta give it to the right person within the right amount of time and ask for the right procedure, whether it's an initial decision or whatever. Now let's pause and talk about subcontractors for a minute because if we're back to the world of plans and specs extras, that GC, your GC, <clears throat> bought the plans and specs from the owner for the general construction scope. You're the mason. <clears throat> your portion of those plans and specs are what you bought from the GC, okay? But the plans and specs go all the way up to the top. In a project delivery system, those plans and specs are the responsibility of the architect <clears throat> and the owner and it comes down to you as the mason sub. But there's a bust, there's a problem, there's a dimension wrong. So you've got to extend that wall 30 feet. That's a lot of block, it's a lot of brick, okay? <clears throat> You're gonna have an extra work plans and specs based claim that goes up a step at a time and is the ultimate responsibility or should be the ultimate responsibility of the construction owner for 30 feet more of wall going that way. You need to team this claim up with your GC because not only do you have notice of claim in your subcontract, but you know the GC has notice of claim in their contract going up. And what if these numbers are different? What if the time frames are different? <clears throat> okay. It might say under your subcontract 21 days on your timely. The GC contract might say seven days. So you give it to the GC on the 14th day, they are already too late. So there is an effort <clears throat> that a well, in my opinion, well managed team will have to communicate about these issues. Make sure they get from the field to whoever is responsible for managing these things in the home office <clears throat> and be sure to grease these issues with your upline so that you, know, if you want them to get their markup, okay? Markup's a good thing, it makes everybody happy. You want them to get their markup, make sure that they know when they have to get the claim in. In that scenario, if in your subcontract, you've got 21 days for notice of claim and the GC's got seven and you get your notice in on 14 day in 14 days, it's not your fault in that instance, Mr. or Ms. Sub, if that claim fails as a plans and specs based claim, you should still get paid. Or if the GC puts it in the inbox and forgets about it for a couple of months, as long as you've complied with your notice of claim, but hey, <clears throat> They're going to be willing to pay a lot quicker if they know they're getting paid. They're not going to be happy about paying if they know they're not going to get paid. So get paid quick, get more quicker, more quicker. How does that sound tough? More quickerest, let me see. Uh, we've been at, holy cow, it's 345. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> These are some notice of claim cases <clears throat> for you to look at if you want to. Freeman versus SUCF, uh, which was later reversed on appeal, but on different, different reasons. Uh, delayed claim loss, which included a subcontractor's claim of 205,000, and it got lost because Freeman didn't give notice of claim in a proper and timely fashion under the SUCF contract document. That's what happened, all claims dismissed, change order claims lost. Tougher industries as well, similar type of thing. Failure to comply with notice of claim, there's lots of cases. <clears throat> claim processing as well, I'm gonna move through those. 
you need to know about statutes of limitation, okay? Because these are like really important. Uh, in New York State, if somebody doesn't pay you, that's a breach of contract. The time that you have to bring a lawsuit for breach of contract is six years. If you are a supplier, it could be four. Okay. Six years is a long time, let's face it. But very often a contract can reduce or shorten a statute of limitations. Okay. I make a note here on this slide that if you're in the world of public works, we talked about this in another class, in addition to having a contract notice or contract statute of limitations, you may have a statute of limitations for special types of claims against public agencies. Okay, but that was another thing for another time. Your contract can set the statute of limitations that you have to bring a lawsuit. Okay. And they do. If you're signing one of the contracts that we prepare for our general contractors, <coughs> excuse me it will have a one year statute of limitations. Oh, wait a minute, uh, Sheets, you said it was six years. I said it was six years, it is six years. Unless you agree by contract to shorten the statute of limitations. So if you do that, please know about it. Please look at the contract. I see these most of the time now. They are very typically, reduced to one year for a subcontractor to sue for non-payment, for a GC or prime to sue for one payment, private works and public. If you look at the SUCF standard form contract, it has a one year statute of limitations, okay? If you look at school jobs, there's a statute out there that makes it a year and a half, makes it a year rather, I'm sorry, a year. There are these are a problem. If your contract reduces the statute of limitations and you don't comply with it, you're going to lose. I've told the story before. Very good client from Montreal. Their in house general counsel calls me. He had a job on a landfill in Burlington, Vermont, and the GC was stiffing him for $310,000. <clears> it's <throat> a lot of money. And he called me. Three day or three weeks before the statute of limitations in his subcontract expired. And it was in December. If he'd have waited till after Christmas to call me, he would have lost his statute of limitations to bring a lawsuit to recover for non payment. So these are real, these are important. Our office has been involved in cases where we have had a six month statute of limitations in one of our general contracts and forced case dismissed, okay? So whoever you are in the pecking order, general prime, sub, 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 whoever you are, vendor, look at your contract, look for a statute of limitations because these are enforceable. If you miss it, the party's over, you're done, okay? You're done. Uh, here on page 21, is an example of what one of these can look at, look like rather, excuse me. <clears throat> I'm gonna keep going. You can look back to that. It's on page 21. Um, if you wanna borrow that language, you're welcome to do that. And then moving on, moving on to the AIA, a401 and just a general discussion with regard to, uh, to subcontracts, which will begin at page 23 of the handout, okay? Um, <clears throat> when you talk about a subcontract, uh, there's often more than meets the eye because as you know, a subcontract will include what's called a flow down clause. The flow down clause in one form or another uh, brings into your subcontract the terms and conditions between the GC and the owner. Okay. So the flow down clause <coughs> is important to a sub. 
My experience has been that GC and primes uh, tend to think that a flow down clause brings more down than it really does, okay? And we're gonna talk about that in some detail in a second. But <clears throat> the language in front of you is the typical type of language that we see for a flow down situation, okay? The subcontract documents consist of this agreement, the subcontract. This is, by the way, the AIA A401 now. <clears throat> and the prime contract, okay? And three modifications, changes to the prime contract and then other stuff that might be listed later in the subcontract in Article 15, where there's an enumeration of contract documents, <clears throat> okay? And then the subcontract is a, the entire integrated deal between the parties, between the GC and the sub, okay? The last language here that this contract supersedes prior negotiations, representations, agreements written or oral, or oral is what I call a zipper clause, it zippers it shut, and those things are out, okay? <clears throat> it doesn't matter what was in your quotation. It doesn't matter unless your quotation is specifically identified <clears throat> as a contract document. And if it is, you ought to put the date of that quotation and you ought to attach it to the contract as a contract document. Because a quotation, a bid is gone. It's zippered out by way of the zipper clause. Too bad it doesn't matter what it said, okay? Doesn't matter what it said. Um, AIA language as well, moving to page 23, 24, tells us <clears throat> that to the extent that the A201 owner contractor agreement applied to our agreement here, our subcontract, then you, the sub, are assuming all the obligations to the contractor that are parallel to what the contractor is assuming with the owner, okay? Which then brings us to flow down clauses. What are they? What do they do? Uh, the subcontractor agrees that portions or all of the contract documents between the owner and the upline entity become part of and incorporated into the subcontract agreement. That's what a flow down clause is. What they typically relate to is the four things you see on this slide. Scope, quality, character of work, and the manner of the work to be performed. This is what's called a general incorporation clause. This is what we see the most, okay? So if you look at these four items, uh, what you're not gonna see in there is things with regard to claims, with regard to payments, because in all likelihood, your subcontract already talks to those things. So very broadly speaking, these four things are what's typically going to flow down. Your situation might be different. Your situation might have a different conclusion. It's gonna depend case by case, contract to contract, okay? So things that are not within the, typically within the scope of one of these general incorporation or general flow down clauses are things like, you know, forum selection, where the lawsuit's gonna be, okay? <clears throat> no damage for delay clause might not flow down. Uh, waiver of damages clause, indemnity agreements might not flow down. Always have an indemnity clause, by the way. Um, arbitration will not typically flow down. So you see there's chinks in that armor um, <clears throat> GCs and primes often tend to overstate what it is uh, that a flow down clause does. Okay. The A4, AIA A401 <clears throat> talks about claims by the contractor. Now it's important if you're in this scenario, in this subcontract scenario, to see that second bullet point under paragraph 3.4 that I have on the slide, because under the subcontract, the contractor has to give you seven days prior notice in writing before they'll be able to back charge you ah, for 
any claims against your company for fixing or finishing your work. Okay, fix and finish, fix and finish. That's what it's all about. They have to give you seven days notice. <clears throat> Contractor remedies, uh, typical stuff. It's in the book there. Um, let's see. Page 29, I'm gonna skip through that. Submittals, page 30. <clears throat> and um, come up to changes here. Let's see if I can find that. Changes in the work. This is on page 31, uh, page 31 of the handout. Uh, the changes clause on your job as a sub may or may not be in an AIA document because while the, the GC might have an A201, you may or may not have an A401, I don't know. But the A401 <coughs> requires prompt submission of a claim as opposed to what the A201 requires, which is 21 days. But there is, as I mentioned before, a good likelihood that the contracts would put together so that if you've got a plan suspects change that goes up to the owner, you've got to get it to the GC in time for them to get it to the owner, okay? And if that doesn't happen, we talked about that already. Uh, changes in subcontract sum and time, just like the general contract, okay? <clears throat> uh, making them promptly. And obviously the usual things that you're used to for claims. Uh, before I do this, payment, uh, keep in mind <clears throat> that uh, there's a thing out there that's called a liquidation agreement. Now that's not in this handout, so you won't find it there. Um, Liquidation agreements are things that when I represent a general contractor, I love, and when I represent a subcontractor, I hate, okay? A liquidation agreement is a contract of its own, an agreement, whereby the subcontractor agrees that its claim is the responsibility of the owner and that it will only recover for its claim to the extent that the GC recovers from the owner, if and when. There's a lot more to it, but that's kind of a nutshell about what these things are. Many subcontracts now have <coughs> liquidation clauses right in the text of the subcontract. You wanna read that stuff. Um, very often for subcontractors, really, liquidation agreements can be disasters, okay? Uh, very often for a GC, they can work wonders because they can get you out from underneath the sub's claim. So, you know, if you find yourself in a situation, subs, when a GC or where a GC is saying to you, hey, here's a liquidation agreement, let's be on a team and fight this thing together, have your skepticism intact, get a hold of an attorney who knows what liquidation agreements are, has dealt with them before and can advise you on them because liquidation agreements can be a bad deal for a sub. That's just a warning. I kind of rambled off the scope of the class, but that's how I am. Um, so the changes clauses are specified there. These are the things. How about payment? Payment section on the handout is on page 34. Um, What's important here under the 8401 document, paragraph 11.1.9, is that if a subcontractor disagrees with a partial or complete <clears throat> disapproval of a application for payment, then the subcontractor may be required to submit a claim as well. Just like we talked about that new thing in the general contract, a 201, you'll find this as well, you may find this as well in the A401. Interest, <clears throat> page 35 of the handout. Hey, interest is worth being aware of because here's another place where subcontractors can really get hurt. But for that matter, so can general and prime contractors. 
most contract documents have a clause that addresses interest. The AIA documents do, many others do as well. How much interest do you get when your payments are late? And if you're worried about it, chances are they're way late. If you're in litigation, that payment of $200,000 might've been sitting out there for four years, okay? I talked about statutes of limitation earlier where I said to you that the parties to a contract can reduce that six year statute <clears throat> or with a supplier, the four year statute. Interest can be reduced as well to zero. And I really encourage you to please locate and look at this clause before you sign your subcontract or your contract, okay? <clears throat> because zero is a bad deal, whoever you are, unless you're the one writing the check, then zero is a great deal. But you really ought to try to negotiate uh, something in for interest. Um, and it would be a negotiation. But zero is bad. Uh, you know, you get zero, one, two percent, you're not getting any money on your loan. And uh, take a careful look at these interest clauses, please. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay, that's a quick horseback ride that was actually an hour time flies when you're having fun with me uh tom just gave me a funny look but um but that's a horseback ride through selected contract provisions um focusing on the aia a201 the aia a401 subcontract um those provisions exist everywhere <clears throat> You know now about AIA stuff, but you also know what to look for in your contract document, okay? Before I talk about this slide and what is the uniform commercial code, let me just ask you, uh, are there any questions? Anybody have a question? If you do, please chat it through to us. If you don't, I'm just gonna keep talking, but I'm not gonna talk much longer. Um, I want to talk about the Uniform Commercial Code because many people don't know about it and you'd be surprised how many lawyers I run into that do not have an operational understanding of this thing called the Uniform Commercial Code. <clears throat> I will tell you that in my opinion, the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC, is one of the best written statutes anywhere. <clears throat> and it deals with what we call things like commercial paper checks, drafts, notes, things of that nature. Article three, article four, article six, whatever. Article two of the Uniform Commercial Code is called sales. You come within article two of the UCC if you're engaged in a transaction for the purchase or sale of goods. Article two of the UCC applies to sellers and buyers of goods. In other words, whether your contract addresses it or not, you may as a supplier, as a manufacturer, as a manufacturer's rep, the UCC is going to apply to what you do. Um, so you're a seller of goods if you're the supplier, the manufacturer, the manufacturer's rep. Under the code, you're, you're selling goods, but you're selling them to a buyer <clears throat> And a buyer for you is typically going to be, I mean, it could be a broker and channel, but it's typically going to be a subcontractor or a contractor. So if I'm a sub, if I'm that Mason sub I talked about a few minutes ago, and I'm buying block from you in, in your yard, that's an Article II transaction. This Article II thing <clears throat> is out there and provides uh, protections to different in different ways to the sellers and to the buyers. It brings with it certain obligations, things of that nature. Uh, so if you're in construction, in all likelihood, <clears throat> it's going to apply to you at some point in time. Article two of the Uniform Commercial Code <clears throat> does not apply between contractors. If, you per, if you're a GC, if you're a sub, it's not an Article two transaction. 
If you're a sub buying lighting fixtures, it is. If you're a GC buying block, it is. So it relates to the sale of goods. It does not relate to the provision of services. Contract doors perform services. They install things. Suppliers, vendors sell goods. That's what the UCC is. The UCC has a lot of little twists and turns. Uh, and things that can trip, trip, uh, trip you up if you're not real careful. We don't have a lot of time, and I didn't figure I would. <clears throat> uh, I have a separate class that I have in past years done for the Syracuse Builders Exchange <clears throat> in more detail on the UCC, because the UCC talks about warranties, it talks about remedies. It talks what a seller, about what a seller can do if the buyer doesn't pay. It tells what a buyer can do if the seller's goods are late or aren't proper, it imposes obligations with regard to inspecting deliveries and things of that nature that are all out there <clears throat> and are all pretty good. But just to kind of creep into the UCC, um, the code tells us that in order for an agreement to buy or sell goods to be enforceable as a matter of law, <clears throat> if it's an X of $500, there has to be something in writing. If there's not, <clears throat> if Tom's over there and he says, hey, Ed, I'll sell you my, my Mac for $5,000. And I shout back and I say, you got a deal, brother. But there's never anything in writing <clears throat> because it's a sale of goods that is probably not going to be an enforceable agreement, okay? <clears throat> now, to be sure, the UCC applies between what the law calls merchants, and I'm not a merchant relative to Tom's Mac, okay? But you, <clears throat> you are a merchant, uh, whether you're a buyer or a seller of goods. The law tells us you're a merchant. So if you're out there, you're a merchant, okay? $500 or more, something's gotta be in writing. Uh, this is a sneaky little thing in the code in that uh, I call it the telephone confirmation rule, okay? Uh, but if there's a deal over the phone, a deal that's done remotely, <clears throat> and one of the parties uh, sends a written confirmation of the deal, it can be binding upon the other party. Ooh, bad possibly, unless the other party objects within 10 days. Uh, so you kind of need to know that. Watch for that, because more often from my experience, just in that particular scenario, <clears throat> uh, sellers can pull a gotcha on you uh, under the code. So the simple point is pay attention to what comes in the mail over the fax if you use those or even an email, okay? The, uh, <clears throat> the code also has a thing that I wanna mention called the battle of the forms. Now, when I, uh, when I do this in person, I have a lot more attachments that I can have people looking at. But <clears throat> typically the transactional uh, trail for a transaction sale of goods is going to include a quote or perhaps a proposal or a request for quote. So there might be, the first thing might be an RFQ from the buyer of goods to the seller. The seller submits a quote. Then the buyer will typically submit a purchase order, a PO, <clears throat> I wanna buy 2000 blue widgets from you for this price, okay? <clears throat> but, but very often, that quotation might go out and might have certain terms and conditions on it. Or it might not have any. <clears throat> but when the PO comes in, there might be terms and conditions. The terms and conditions might differ from what's in the quotation. Or if there are none in the quote, except for the, the item, the quantity, the price, data delivery stuff, then there'll be a whole new set of conditions coming into the transaction by way of the PO. 
you are the seller, let's say. What becomes part of your contract? <clears throat> Where does the contract form? When the PO includes stuff that's not in your quotation, what wins? Okay, whose terms win? That's called the battle of the forms under the code. And in the code, it's a thing called uh, article uh, section 2-207, which by the way, <clears throat> you can probably find online anywhere. Uh, and on the, the state, uh, usually the legislature has all state laws, a link to them. So you can frolic through UCC article two if you have nothing better to do this evening. But the code tells us, <clears throat> okay, Going. that when additional terms come along with the acceptance of an offer, the additional terms <clears throat> will, will become part of the deal. So you send a quote, I send you a PO with my terms and conditions. My stuff becomes the deal. Unless one of three things happen. The quote is expressly limiting acceptance to the terms of the quotation, which has got to be done very clear, very obvious. In my world, big, dark, bold print. Or <clears throat> the new terms that I try to stick you with are a material change, whatever that means, uh, to the quotation. And we'll talk about a few examples of that. Okay. Or <clears throat> if I'm the guy sending you that nasty purchase order. Within a reasonable time, you give notice of objection. So if you're a vendor and my PO includes terms, you gotta look at these things, okay? You gotta, because you could get stuck to my terms unless you're so lucky to have a judge say you come in with, with, with an exception number two, if it's a material alteration of the quote. But when you get there, you're off, you're off in lawyer land, okay? Material changes. An arbitration clause was held by a court to be a material change, okay? That's one example. Uh, clauses which place the location of lawsuits, this may sound a little familiar with an earlier thing, <clears throat> would be a material change. If I put that in my PO, that would probably not be enforceable to you. Okay, oh, and there I am. And here we are. Uh, that's kind of a horseback run just through the Uniform Commercial Code. There's a lot more that we could talk about, but uh, we're kind of slim on time, it's already 415. And you wanna go home. <clears throat> and if you find that you're interested in more on uh, UCC Article 2 and buyers and sellers stuff, <coughs> excuse me, uh, tell somebody at the Builders Exchange. Tell Melissa Gould, tell Earl Hall, or anybody over here. And, uh, you know, we could always fire up that, uh, that seminar again. And it would be uh, probably about an hour's worth of time, maybe an hour and 10 minutes. I keep it short. And uh, that having been said, I'm done. Uh, are there any questions about any of this stuff or any other stuff? Uh, you know, if you have a question, ask me. Now's a good time. Free legal advice. How could you go wrong? Um, I'm happy to discuss something, even if it's not within the scope of what we've talked about. Um, you can either turn your mute off on your microphone or uh, enter a question into the chat. And Tom just pointed out, he put my email address out there somewhere. So if you email us a question, if you'd rather it be private, we respond to these things. As I've told SPE members before, we don't charge you to respond to an email. You're a member of the exchange. We're a member of the exchange. If you have a question, a short question, we'll talk to you. And you're not going to get a lawyer's bill. Okay? That'd be wrong. All right, I'm going to sign off. And I wish you the best. Take care.